for, <laughs> as we say sometimes. Um, so uh, this talk is about accessibility, but it's really about communication. So everyone has their own special way of saying hello. Um, and when we're talking about accessibility, we're talking about how we communicate hello to somebody who has a barrier between them and how we usually interact with other people. And that's kind of the point of accessibility is to bring down that barrier as much as possible. So what is accessibility? Um, so we are talking about designing products, devices, services, and environments for people who have accessibility issues. Now, there's a wide variety of accessibility issues. We're gonna go into kind of a lot of the more common ones, things that like you will see as the most, uh, the most prevalent. Um, and uh, we'll talk about like, who needs accessibility? Um, basically, everybody, everybody. But we're going to be giving a particular emphasis to people with physical impairments, vision impairment, deaf, hard of hearing, uh, and cognitive and intellectual impairments. All right. But really, whose responsibility is accessibility? Um, I, for one, when I was being hired, did not have accessibility expert in my tagline. But, and that's going to be the case with the vast majority of developers, um, but um, then again, in all of the environments I've been hired in, almost nobody has had that as a requirement of their job. Accessibility hasn't been a priority. And the thing is, is that when nobody's responsible, then we kind of all have to be. Uh, so I think that we should really be thinking about, you know, having accessibility as kind of the bog standard in regards to our development environments in general and for sp specific reasons, um, and I will be going into those. Um, let's see. So does anybody here have like a rough estimate like in regards to how many people they think in the world have accessibility issues? Just like throw out some numbers. Does anybody have like an idea? Let's give a half. All right, we got half the planet that seems uh, pretty high, but uh, you know, twenty-five percent. <laughs> okay, so so what it's telling me, and this should be telling you, is nobody's entirely sure in this room, kind of like where that standard is. Um, so we're going to be talking about people with some form of disability. Um, and the accessibility that we're talking about needing for them. So these are internet like statistics. So basically uh, what we have is uh, 7 billion 600,000 people more or less on the planet. Of those people, how many of them are internet users? It's roughly a, a little bit more than half of the entire population of the world. And these are people who have access to the internet, not just technology. So we're talking about 4,200,000 people as of 2018 who have access to just the internet. And that's to services, that's to uh, architectures, that's to us. No matter where you are in the world, um, you can watch this presentation. Um, but uh, so we're talking about roughly 55% of the population of the world has access to technology. Um, so would it surprise you to find that the WHO decided that about 15% of the entire population of the world has an accessibility issue? Um, so we're talking like 1.2 billion people have some kind of barrier between them and you if you are not developing with accessibility in mind. All right, uh, kind of glossed over that one. Uh, but it's fine. Um, so when we're talking about accessibility issues, we're not just talking about like a permanent accessibility issue. 
there's a lot of people who experience disability temporarily. You break an arm, suddenly it's really hard to navigate around your computer when you have a mouse that's not configured, you're not used to it. So you're asking somebody who's like right hand dominant to now switch to left hand. And I don't know about you guys, have you ever tried this as an experiment? If you haven't, super fun, especially on somebody else's computer. <laughs> Just uh, switch, uh, switch over. It's, it's very much the same as like turning their monitor the opposite way and just like watch them try to navigate to get back to it. It's really funny until somebody, that is their life. And um, so we're talking about like, the vast majority of people will have like a broken arm. Uh, somebody will have a concussion. Um, do you have another option? Well, I was gonna say one-handed typing because you broke your arm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's like, there's a lot of things that happen when we're talking about like temporary stuff that you kind of understand, but uh, if you haven't personally experienced it, you don't know the pitfalls. So, and then we're going to be talking about like people who are starting to age up and dealing with all the problems as your flesh unit starts to degrade. <laughs> uh, there are a few modifiers for it at this point. <laughs> Okay, so, and part of those uh, issues, those barriers that we see, we see a lot of overlapping kind of needs for people within that kind of a group. So when we're talking about, uh, uh, I have a lot of examples as we're going through, so we'll go over a lot of those uh, overlapping needs, but uh, many groups uh, experience the internet and technology through the same mediums. Uh, and if there is a barrier to them, then they are seeing a lot of barriers that are very similar. So somebody with a visual impairment is going to have some of the same issues gaining access to the technology that they need as say somebody with a physical impairment because the way that they're meant to navigate is very similar and how they're meant to gain information has a lot of uh, has a lot of the similarities between those. Um, so what that means for us as technology people is that there's a lot of opportunity to produce beneficial tools for multiple groups of people. Um, and once you like cap out at a certain group of tool sets, then there's avenues to uh, produce more specific tools based off of that architecture. It's a little bit like Hydra you cut off one head and then like many spring forth. Uh, that is like, that's the technology kind of idiom that I think this really uh, provides an opportunity for. Um, uh, the other part of this is that there's a lot of accessibility tools that are fantastic for people without accessibility needs. Uh, I don't know if you guys, uh, play a lot of games, but there's uh, an Alienware computer that came out not too long ago with eye tracking. And this is completely just meant for gaming. Fantastic for somebody with ALS who's lost the ability to utilize their limbs. And so my, uh, one of my best friend's fathers recently passed from ALS, and this was a tool that he was using to text message, to browse Facebook, to write his last will and testament. He wrote it himself, had it verified by a lawyer friend. All of this done with a piece of technology that was intended for like blowing up space blocks. So, you know, there's a lot of things that are multi-layer, have they have multiple interactions that are beneficial for multiple types of people. And that's a little bit of like my underlying thought process here is that Accessibility is good for everybody. All right. Um, so, and when we're talking about accessibilities, there's uh, four principles. They follow the POUR method, P-O-U-R. Um, I will give a very brief overview of kind of what that means. There's a lot of text, I hate doing that, but it's like very specific stuff. Uh, perceivability is information and user interface components must be presented to users in a way that is perceivable. So if you have a website open, I know that many of you were here in the 90s. 
how many of you opened up a website and music just started playing? Or, welcome to GeoCities. So that is an issue because there was never a subtitle. If you're deaf or hard of hearing, that's a perceivability issue. So if there's information that's specific to the website or a secret or something like that, if not every user can perceive it, it's a huge issue. So uh, that is what they mean by perceivability, is that don't have a thing that has a blocker for understanding, just like built in. Um, let's see, uh, operatable. Uh, user interface components and navigation must be operatable. Uh, this means that a user must be able to operate the interface. So if you, uh, some of you are probably Linux buffs. Uh, gonna throw it out there. And don't necessarily use a mouse. Uh, this is completely for you. Uh, this is uh, basically a lot of websites now, especially I'm gonna be I'm gonna throw myself under the bus uh, from front end developers. Uh, don't necessarily have just a tab through kind of mentality. They're like, oh, but look at this beautiful design that when you try to tab to it doesn't arrive. It just never gets there. Uh, that is an operatable snafu. That is uh, not what you want. Uh, let's see. Understandable information and the uh, operation of user interface must be understandable. Uh, this means that um, I, I know that a lot of people probably, uh, this is a little bit of a looser one because understandability is a little bit of a harder kind of like, this is the barrier right here. Um, but pretty much this means, you know, being very clear, very direct. Uh, I used to grade college papers, so don't do those kinds of uh, information sharing, because uh, I can tell you what, I read through at least two dozen papers, not in the very distant past, and I had no idea what the project was from any of those papers. So that's a like that's an understandability issue. And like that's one that um, it's, it's a little bit harder to kind of conceptualize. And robust. Content must be robust enough that, the, uh, that it can be re interpreted reliably by a wide variety of user agents, including, including assistive technology. So um, this means that uh, when you're uh, dealing with a screen reader, uh, all of your media should have an alternative kind of a tag in it. Because like, um, if you get a picture, the picture doesn't tell you what's in it. Like there's some really, really cool open source like uh, technology now that's being able to grab a picture and kind of tell you what it thinks is in it. Uh, I wrote a uh, really janky hackathon kind of a program that took an image in told you what it thought was in the image, and then we uh, queried the Gutenberg press to try to find poetry related to those key words. So we got some really, really interesting kind of interpretations, but that's not most technology. That's, uh, that is still in the conceptual phase. It hasn't even gone to like alpha or yet, so, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of the robustness is that uh, having that kind of information baked in is just super easy for um, screen readers and other technology. Let's see. And why are we, uh, what are we doing to standardize this process? Well, we have a beautiful thing called the WCAG. Um, it's the conformance uh, guidelines that a lot of the accessibility kind of stuff is following. If anybody does international business, this is a very necessary resource because this is the standard by which the European Union mandates their accessibility standards. So I don't know if any of you guys pay attention, but like the European Union is real good about suing you. Real solid. Uh, it's like one thing that I wish that they weren't so great at. Uh, but uh, if you have international business that is uh, somehow hosted or prevailed in Europe, uh, this is a very important uh, document that you should take a look at uh, because they uh, mandate by law that websites should meet a certain level of accessibility. Uh, and so I think that's good anyway. They just have teeth for their legislation. 
Um, but they ha currently have three levels. So you have A, which is the bare minimum, uh, and it's non-text elements, uh, have text equivalent IDs, all content accessible via the keyboard, works with the screen reader. The, that's the bare minimum. Uh, number two is they're talking about CSS elements. So having a really, really stark contrast between your background and your text because uh, it's really good for people with eye impairments. When I forget my glasses, sometimes I wish I had more of this. Uh, let's see, well-organized, consistent design, live subtitles on videos, uh, text size changeable. So if you're going to be uh, uh, zooming in on something, the text kind of changes so that you don't then have to try to follow where the text goes and then go back, because that is not a fun exercise, let me tell you. And uh, the AAA score, which is the gold standard, very, very few sites meet this. So if you're aiming for AAA, great, but it's like aiming to the moon because you'll end up among the stars kind of a thing. Um, I would, as a funny joke, uh, well, CAG's website does not meet AAA standard uh, guidelines. So that's fun. <laughs> uh, well, CAG? Yeah, so, um, so now we're gonna kind of go into like understanding kind of what kind of barriers are between uh, accessibility issues and content. Uh, let's see. So we're gonna go with visual. All of these are blind uh, in a certain level. So even though the one right here looks like a completely normal eye, doesn't work. Uh, the second one, this sucker, is actually an extremely rare genetic uh, defect. Um, I, I have what it is on my other slide. I, I will put it in the notes. Um, but, it has, but this person is receiving light and information from two different sources, and it's hitting very different parts of the eye. So it's like looking at an Escher painting, kind of. Like, there's colors, there's like, stuff going on, but they're not getting it. And the second and the third one uh, is cataracts, which is an extremely prevalent eye issue internationally. Um, I was uh, working with somebody who went to Nepal, specifically Nepal, to address uh, removing cataracts, and was see and had removed cataracts from almost forty thousand people's eyes. That's Nepal. And um, like this is an issue specifically in more developing countries because um, their healthcare system is not as standard. Uh, and but at the same time, the United States has a lot of people with cataracts as well. Like it's one of those things that an occlusion of the uh, lens of the eye is just very very common. Uh, anyway, so there are a lot of visual impairments. So these are kind of like the medical standard variety of them. So uh, I can see a lot of people here have midi uh, medium visual acuity issues. You're like me, you've got glasses. Um, low acuity issues are uh, blurred vision uh, over three meters. So that's more my category. I'm not going to assume with everybody else. We've got macular degeneration, blurred or dark central vision, tunnel vision, which means that it's dark or blurred on the edges, uh, limited light perception. Uh, this is like cataracts. And then you have total blindness, no light perception whatsoever. Uh, and these are kind of like the medical standards for how that looks. And then you just have like the eye test thing because it was a great graphic. Um, but let's talk about the implications thereof. Uh, 1.3 billion people live with some form of visual or vision impairment. Uh, that is um, statistics there. <laughs> it's uh, going to, I don't want to read through because then I, I seem like um, it's, I'm not engaging. But that means that globally the leading, and uh, one of the things is that globally the leading cause of vision impairment is uncorrected refractory errors and cataracts. So this is kind of what I meant, like the vast majority of people um, who have vision impairment issues uh, have a vision impairment issue that can be addressed if they had access to medical care that could provide it. But even though they might not have access to that medical care immediately, internet and technology can really help them connect with people to do it. 
the my friend who works in Nepal, almost nobody there has internet, but they've had a very, very prominent uh, social media campaign that is like gone beyond the internet. So they're contacting local uh, people to get in contact with everybody that they can who has cataracts in the area to then go to the central location so that he can work on them. And that's like, that has been fantastic. But it's only made possible by communication via social media and uh, the internet. All right. And yeah. So um, how many people here have colorblindness? Some form of it. All right, we got two, three, four. All right, so about four people in the audience have some form of colorblindness. Uh, do, you, do you guys want to self-identify kind of what you cannot see? Uh, green and brown. Okay, so that puts you uh, probably at uh, tritonopia. Uh, that's, that's usually where we're, we're going. Um, does anybody else have uh, want to self-disclose where they're at? If you don't, that is completely fine. Very mild to medium Okay, so that probably has you at Deuteronomia, Molly, Molly, Deuteronomoly. Anyway, sorry, it's it's gr all Greek to me sometimes. So um, as we've discovered, we've got four people in the room who are self-disclosing that they have some kind of color uh, impair, uh, color blindness issue. So what that means is that um, real common, especially uh, I think all the people who had their hands up are uh, people who work in technology themselves. Like it's, uh, it's much more of one of those issues that um, uh, the, the, the bare statistics are 94% of people do not have a color blindness issue. But that means that 6% do have a color blindness issue. So when you're developing for uh, websites and stuff, uh, having, uh, have, have you, any of you guys seen those bubbles that have like a lot of colors and then they have like a nine and a slightly different color? Uh, yeah, those, those are, they're the worst. They're literally the worst. Um, but even though we have this called out to like do one of those, there's a lot of instances where it happens anyway, but it's not called out. And that kind of an instance uh, where there's a, like a lot of meshes of color all kind of in the same tone is going to be an issue for somebody with a color, uh, color blindness impairment. Uh, so this is a lot of like the website backgrounds who are tone on tone which looks really nice a lot of the time if you're a front-end developer because tone on tone is like a very appealing kind of a look. Real, real crappy if you've got a color blindness issue. <laughs> um, and these are statistics in regards to it. So 4.6% of men have deuteronomaly. 1% um, have uh, prote protonopia. I totally had these remembered and then I completely spaced. Uh, uncommon is uh, tritonopia, uh, and real uncommon is total color blindness. So uh, all I see is black and white. Uh, that is 0.00003% of the population. This is about how many people it actually affects, though. So we've got almost, uh, let's see, 3 million, uh, 375 million people. Uh, have trouble with uh, being able to see uh, the first slide. So they have deuteronomaly. That is a interesting statistic that I'll just throw out there. Um, 76 million people have protonopia, uh, 760,000 people have tritonopia, and uh, 260,000 people have monochromacy. So that is not a small number of people. Uh, I'll tell you what, uh, certain websites I've worked for would like to have 260,000 people go to their website in general. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> it is what it is. Um, okay. And so for people with uh, visual impairment issues, 
we have uh, a, a large uh, number of options because there's not just one way to build a wheel. There are several uh, different ways to kind of address specific issues and make them uh, less prevalent. So um, if, has anybody seen a refresher braille? Yeah, okay, that, that uh, does not surprise me. <laughs> but uh, so refresher brailles are really great. Um, they have a braille system that reads text from screen. Uh, this is uh, like the next level of a screen reader if you are in an environment where that is not a, uh, something that's going to work for you or if you just hate screen readers. I've had a lot of people that I've interacted with who just hate them. And to be fair, I've used them before and they are not super great. Uh, they work in a pinch if you have no other option, but they're not super great. Um, and as we'll go to the next one, screen readers, uh, they, most major uh, computer system technology has some variety of screen reader um, and Oh, okay, okay. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there's like, uh, Orca screen readers is something that I was going to have a little bit later as like recommended technology to take a look at. Um, but screen readers uh, do fill a gap in a lot of technology. Um, let's see, uh, another one that I uh, really, really enjoy are image readers. So they take, you take a picture and it identifies text in the picture. Some of them will start identifying things like restaurants, like Google has some interesting technology there. And so these are really, really important um, for people who have a visual impairment but also in certain areas for people who don't. Um, I'll get more specific with that in a minute. And then we have like zooming technology if your visual impairment is not uh, greater than a certain level. Let's see. Um, here's, uh, I'll just go into an example of like making a piece of technology that's bog standard a little bit more accessible. So uh, this is a place order form. So what we have is the pay with method, ship to, remember details, subtotal, shipping, tax, total, and then a button for place order. So this is very bog standard. You see this in almost every website where you can purchase something. Uh, does anybody see any issues with this? <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so uh, I will go in. Uh, so. The payment or pay with and the payment method are very far from each other. Uh, I, as a person who is uh, visually okay, uh, still have to drag my eyes from pay with all the way or over to the drag down screen. Uh, so this is an example of not the best. But same information, we have an ex uh, a more accessible place order form. So we've got subtotal, shipping, tax, total, all close together so you understand where things are going very linearly. Uh, pay with method has the drop down directly to below it, so um, it is visually very appealing. But also, if you are using a tablature, it leads directly to it. It's like one here and then bam, right there. And remember, details is right next to its own checkbox. This is an example of not a huge difference, but it makes a huge difference. All right, I'm getting a little close in time, so I'm gonna rush a little bit for the next one. So other common examples, uh, this is an example of a poor distinction between the text and the background because they are the same level and it's not very stark. Uh, the one we have here is a text over photo element that is very busy. I myself do not like it. Uh, and then we have an example of a carousel. Carousels are really, really, really bad with screen readers, just as a heads up. Uh, they're also terrible in general, in my opinion. <laughs> but uh, specifically, they are uh, not super great uh, in regards to accessibility. So if you can avoid them, I'd really suggest it.
but here's a good example. So this is eBay. They've got a advertisement for Nikon lenses, uh, but their alt text is uh, focus on your grad, Nikon cameras and lenses up to 40% off, shop now, which is the text in the picture. So this is really, really great because it tells you what's in the picture, but also because web crawlers pay attention to that stuff, gets more traffic to your website. Um, let's see. Best practices for those with minor site issues, higher contrast background and text, punctuations and abbreviations because text readers read the punctuation. And so they'll go W, C, A, G as opposed to, okay. And if you don't know what the letters are supposed to be, uh, WCAGs can be W, K, A, G. It can be like a, a lot of permutations of those letters. Uh, design fluid in interspaces, so you can stretch them out and stretch them in. Uh, streamline and simplify your interfaces. A lot of busy stuff was like super great when MySpace was your major interaction, uh, but we're a little bit more adult now, for better or for worse. I mean, most of us. <laughs> uh, those with major, major site issues, the clean design again helps with the uh, interface. Screen reader accessible, uh, provide alt text uh, for all media, uh, and the external CSS for styling, uh, all elements accessible via tab. All right. uh, here are some accessibility checkers. All right, we're gonna go with hearing. Uh, so about 5% of the population interacts with uh, a, uh, some kind of hearing or uh, tone issue. So a lot of people who are not, do not consider themselves deaf might be tone deaf, like my father. He, all, he thinks that certain music is great and he can't hear explosions. Slightly different tone deafness, but I think relevant to each other. Uh, so what we're talking about, um, there's like a range of issues, like my dad can't hear explosions because he was a demolitions expert. Uh, so those ranges are dead to him now. So uh, certain things he just doesn't hear. So if you figure out that tone and you talk in it, you're like, I told you about that. Um, <laughs> I might have taken advantage of that a little bit when I was in high school. Uh, so uh, and as an example, like deafness in one way or another can be congenital, which means you're born with it, or it can be acquired later on in life. Um, not, and as a, another aside, not all deaf people sign, but many do. Um, providing the option of having an interpreter on your videos is a triple A WCAG requirement, um, which it starts getting interesting because not everybody signs the same sign. So I can sign things here that work perfectly in Portland, make no sense to anybody here. That's, that's a fun part. Um, okay. So uh, this is a part where we're talking about overlapping needs. Adding subtitles or transcripts uh, to your content is not only accessible, but it's practical. Uh, so a lot of people utilize subtitles who are not themselves deaf or hard of hearing. Um, a lot of people will be scrolling through Facebook on the bus, not have their headphones in. That media content that they are accessing, if they don't have subtitles, they don't know what's going on. So. This is good business sense to uh, apply subtitles because uh, as we see, 85% of videos on Facebook are viewed without sound. 16% uh, uh, is an average reach of subtitled video above a video that is not subtitled. So you have 16% of those that are seen more. Uh, more clicks on a website are acquired by uh, having subtitles versus non-subtitles. Uh, you get more reactions if you're looking for that uh, from having something with subtitles as opposed to without. And your share rate increases. So you have people that are more interested in sharing your content outside of where it originates. So this kind of stuff starts like really diving into if you guys are focused on getting media to you, putting subtitles on your videos is a fantastic element to just increase uh, like market share. All right. And the best practices are to do it for videos or music. Uh, if you don't have a content that has a video, 
uh, providing a transcript is fantastic as well. It's great for deaf folks. It's fantastic for people with cognitive impairments. And it's really good for web crawlers. Uh, so, you know, if, if you need another reason other than accessibility, web crawlers love them. And it pays back in dividends. Like, web crawlers will direct people to your website based on content. Uh, and uh, another best practice is have multiple ways of communicating. So Twitter, uh, Instagram, literally any of these social media platforms are highly utilized by people in the deaf and hard of hearing communities. Um, like, it's because there's so few people that are deaf or hard of hearing, they have to navigate a world in which that is not the norm. And so they have these tools and accessibility stuff that they make themselves for communication. So social media is absolutely fantastic for that. Um, and then we're going to go into physical. Um, we've got uh, Stephen Hawking, who I think is one of the better kind of ways to like really think about it, because he had such an impactful disability, but he was still able to do so much. Um, and then the guy in the middle is somebody from Great Britain who uh, was in the military who had his arm. Uh, in an accident, and he is now utilizing one of the most cutting edge uh, prosthesis in the world. Uh, it can crack an egg and intentionally, which I think is fantastic. Um, okay, so what are physical disabilities? Because it's a huge range of things. Um, characterized as a lack of functionality or ability uh, of a, by a body part or system. Uh, either loss of the body part or loss of the ability to use it. Uh, is that? Okay, I, I will try to. I will try to be a little bit clearer. Uh, so we're talking about like my friend's father who had ALS had a degenerative disease that made it so he was like having a little bit of trouble walking and then by the end he could only move his eyes. Um, and there's multiple ways to be impacted. That's not just how it goes. Um, again, we talked about the uh, arm thing. Uh, a lot of people who have uh, these physical disabilities are still very strong tool users. I got the five minute mark, so I'm gonna rush through. Um, so these are common tools for people with physical disabilities. We've got switches, which uh, are left, right, confirm, or deny is usually how it goes. We have voice controls, which uh, if anybody has uh, an OK uh, Google thing uh, or just an uh, Android phone, we have mobility styluses. You don't see many of these anymore, for the better part. And then you have the eye tracking technology. This is the one that we were talking about earlier. Um, so this is an example of a really good kind of accessibility website because all of these elements can be tabbed through, and they're very clear with where the tab is. Uh, this is a bad example. So it's kind of all over the place. It's not really clear where you end up. Uh, this is unfortunately kind of bog standard for a lot of websites that don't think about accessibility. Uh, specific concerns, uh, larger buttons, calling out elements in web pages for what they are. Like button has a very clear distinction for what it's supposed to do in a web uh, or in a verbalizer, um, but like a div that functions as a web button, not clear. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, we've got tab index. Many devices that improve usability for everyone are beneficial for those with uh, disabilities. Uh, we're going to go a little bit into cognitive. So uh, many uh, cognitive impairments are not static. They are fluctuating. So you have people who have like brain injuries who are getting better or getting worse, depending. Uh, there are uh, people who have uh, like uh, some kind of uh, issue with uh, like medications or like just uh, deep conceptual understanding. Um, let's see. But the bare basics are uh, memory, problem solving, attention, reading, linguistics, and verbal comprehension math comprehension and visual comprehension. These are the kind of ideas of where that is. Um, so people with disabilities of the mental or cerebral kind of range in the two to 5% range. But these are people who are also still using the internet uh, as we uh, have, we have a lot of tools in say iPad space that actually are really good. 
Um, and in Android, we've got a lot of uh, options. Let's see, best practices. Clear, concise text, smaller paragraphs, consistent page design, clear functionality, and a low learning threshold. A uh, good example of this is YouTube. Bad example is Facebook. Um, but as you see with best practices, this is not the first time we've heard a lot of these things because there's a lot of overlapping kind of need there. The takeaways, people with disabilities make up millions of users. Uh, when using the web, many find barriers and will often click away from sites that have, they are having difficulty with. So if your website or interaction is not uh, easy to access, they will leave. So you will lose out on them. Uh, makes it good for everybody. Uh, these are some common screen readers. Uh, uh, NVDA is a Python Windows-based one. Orca is a Linux one. Uh, we've got some magnifiers, virtual magnifying glass. Subtitle or voice to text, Caldi and Simon are great. Gaze tracking, Pygaze and MIT Pupil. MIT Pupil, since we're at MIT. Uh, yeah, and thank you. This has been my presentation. Uh, I don't know how much time we have left. We have about one minute, but uh, is this working? I don't think that's I don't working. Think that's I, can't, working. I, can't, I can't hear that one. Can you make it up here? It's not accessible. <laughs> um, because we went a little bit long. Into this one you can hear? Oh, yeah. OK. Anybody have a question? Time for one. Yep. Just, can you? Oh, I'll just bring it up. <laughs> I would also like to add sensory input problems to yes. what you said. So I get uh, migraines that are triggered by black background with white text. And there are a lot of websites that I just can't read, including one of my husband's websites. <laughs> Shame. <laughs> so, so, so you talked about uh, having the option to change uh, font size on websites. But yes. also, and I know front end developers don't want to hear, have the ability to change your themes, but if you can have like a light theme and a dark theme or something like yeah, that. Yeah, no, I think that is absolutely fantastic. And I will point out that like there's a lot of things that I myself don't know because I haven't experienced them. So I will be adding that to my presentation as an inclusion for the next time. Uh, does anybody else have any questions, comments? I love feedback. We're, we're unfortunately out of time. Or you can talk to me outside. <laughs> Thank you guys so much.